Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. And our first three speakers tonight are Alexis, Joe, and John. Didn't know whether to start my timer before the clapping ends or not. Anyway, that gives you a clue as to how my mind works. I'm Alexis, I'm an alcoholic, yes. uh, and I'm obsessed with details and over analysis. So, um, yeah, real honor to share here for the group anniversary. Um, I, um, I just wanted to share my experience of my recovery. Um, in particular, I wanted to start with when I first met Wayne P. <laughs> Back in, I don't know, when it, I get confused, my girlfriend tells me different dates. I might have met him in 93 or 92. Um, and thank you, Wayne, for sponsoring me because he did become my sponsor. But I met him, a spoiler really, wasn't it? But I met him at the Wednesday night step meeting. And I'd been to, I'd been to a few AA meetings. And I think something that stuck out for me, the thing I remember about his share was he said he'd just had his first photos published in the Times or the Telegraph or something. And, and I think what struck me, apart from the fact I was thinking, hey, I'd like her photos in the Times or the Telegraph, these were photos taken by him, well, not of him, I'd, you know. <laughs> but, and I thought, I, I'd like photos in that. But, but what really struck me, now I look back on it, was I'd, it was the first real share that talked about someone getting on with life and achieving something in life. Um, and I think this was a big contrast to me to what I'd heard before. And to my amazement, he invited me for coffee. This, this isn't going to be a, like all hail Wayne share. I'm just, but he's my sponsor, right? I mean, any of you that have gone through the steps with a sponsor know that for me to talk about my recovery involves me talking a lot about my sponsor. Um, and I was, he invited me for coffee that night. Um, I was in a funny position because I had had a sponsor before that, sort of, um, and he was four years sober. And I keep on saying to him, when are we going to do the steps? When are we going to do the steps? And he, we just didn't seem to get started on the steps. And uh, with Wayne, he immediately gave me a daily plan to do. Well, actually, before that, I said that, I'd become very untrusted, trusting in AA because I, I liked... I thought I trusted in doctors and I trusted in psychiatrists, but they couldn't help me stop drinking. I came to AA and I thought, all right, maybe these people can really help me stop drinking, but they didn't seem to have any system. I know you see the steps on the walls all the time. Maybe it's changed in Plymouth since then. But AA in Plymouth, there didn't seem to be any system, right? You just, you just kept coming to meetings and it got better, apparently. And I, I was, wanted a system. I wanted to know what to do. And of course, it was there, and it was read out at every meeting, but no one seemed to talk about it when they were sharing. And Wayne, I think he, he must have gone on about um, the big book a lot, because that was something that, and that led to me parting with my previous sponsor, because he seemed to be saying stuff that contradicts the big book, my previous sponsor. And I, I, but I couldn't bring myself to ask him to sponsor me. Because I thought, this AA is unreliable. These people are amateurs. The half of them seem to be depressed. A quarter of them seem to be insane. How can I? I gave my entire trust to someone who then, a week ago, my mother told me was insane. This is my previous sponsor. Five old timers in Plymouth sat around me after the Scott Hospital meeting and said, your sponsor is insane. This is my previous sponsor, I to I feel I have to clarify everything. Um, so I was, it was really difficult, but Wayne, thank God, and this sounds really silly, but he offered to temporary sponsor me, like we do at this group, right? We say at the end, if you want a temporary sponsor, and I, in my mind, I thought, I don't want a bloody temporary sponsor, mate. I want you as my sponsor, but I didn't say that because I, I was nervous. And we did the steps, and we did, and I was so relieved that there was a system in place, you know, that this guy had a practical system in place. I, immediately, I went home that night, um, there was this daily plan, which was that, that we wrote down six things in those days. And it was actually called the six things back then. And you can see it in the Road to Recovery archives. Um, 
which, uh, if you're interested, ask Wayne about. And it was great. And the next day I was doing it. And then a week later, a week later, we were doing the first three steps. I remember I started on the fourth step. I shared it in a meeting. I was so excited. Thursday night Nuffield, for those that remember, the largest meeting in Plymouth that died about four years after that because they didn't follow the traditions. Large, I said, I'm on step four. This is brilliant. I'm doing the steps. I'm so glad that I'm doing this at last. After all my promises, I'm doing the steps. And, and this guy shared back at me, uh, don't worry, he said, I'm five years, he said, don't rush, I'm five years sober, I've not even done the steps or done the fourth step yet. And this was the sort of atmosphere that I was living in, so obviously I was very, but I was excited, I did, and one of the other things the fourth step did that was great, I'd be, I'd be in meetings, and for those that haven't done it, right, in the fourth step, I tried to look at my part in everything. So I'd always gone through my life thinking, they're all har harming me, they're all hurting me. Why, why are people so difficult to me? Why is life so difficult to me? Why do they make me suffer? Why do they make it hard? Why do they put pressure on me? Why do they nag me? Why do they let me down? Why did they do that to me in my childhood? Why? Why did they do this? But in my step four, I actually wrote down my part in this, this, these defects of character. And it had a weird effect. About halfway through, I was sitting in meetings, and I'd hear people sharing the way I used to think. They'd be saying, like, I feel, I feel really depressed today. I've, you know, my um, cat has crapped on my favorite seat or whatever and I'm so and I just think and I didn't say this like but I think that's just your self-pity you know and or somebody being angry against their partner and I'll be thinking in my head that's just your pride uh, I, it was it was great it was great and I I was I was I was a bit worried thinking these things you know but it was it was and you can imagine if I was involuntarily thinking that in meetings, just imagine what was happening in my heart. You know, by the time I'd done that step four, and the other thing in the step four, there was we, we get we kind of tell our sponsors all our deepest, darkest secrets, not because they want to know them, uh, and, but because um, the freedom, the freedom it brings, and and I knew really the funny thing is with step four, and this is not entirely true, but. You could kind of just take a page of my step four, compress it down into the really... And I remember saying to Wayne, there's only really two or four things that I'm really worried about sharing with you, but I'm not going to tell you yet. Um, and then we did the step five, and I, I read the whole four out, and of course, including those things that I thought I was going to die with no one else knowing. And of course, that makes you so lonely. If you think you're going to die, if you think you can't tell anyone something, it makes you so lonely and it's just a dead thing inside it's no good to anyone and it just makes you separate um and that that thing that freedom became part of me that freedom of uh not having to blame other people for how i felt became part of me and i understood the uh the misery is optional uh, you know i understood i understood what it meant um I will just, I don't want to go through the steps. It's funny, my very first share in AA at the Sunday Night Vision for You in Plymouth, I went through the steps one by one. I remember saying to Wayne, was that all right? I thought I'd done brilliant. He said, yeah, that, that was all right. Most people, when they start, do go through the steps one by one. And I was like, are you saying it wasn't amazing? But, so I'm going to try and not go through the steps. But I do want to say something for anyone new about like eight and nine. I, I realized after I did step nine and I you tried to make amends for these things, ask forgiveness for, for the, the harms I'd done. And I hadn't, until I'd done it, I hadn't realized this. I'd walk around the streets of Plymouth. I'm from Plymouth. You know, my history's really in Plymouth. There's a bit, a bit of London. But, and I would walk around. I realized before I'd done the step nine, I used to walk around the streets of Plymouth. And I was always nervous of who I might bump into. And I hadn't even realized this for years. I hadn't realized I was scared of bumping into people. And the step nine, and it wasn't like... I didn't do everything in my step nine. There were people I couldn't really approach or talk to, but that was, that was a wonderful feeling. Um, anyway, enough, enough about that. I could go into an analysis of what each step contributed to my mental health. What I will say to you, if you're new, I do want to say this one thing. I could not see, and I swear from my heart, I could not see when I came to AA how those 12 steps, those 12 steps, were true mental health and alcoholism therapy, treatment. I could not see they were real. I thought, what people... I don't know what I thought. But anyway, I couldn't see they were real. And, but they are. They're absolutely real. My mental health 
if you, you know, that's what they call it nowadays, right? My mental health went in leaps and bounds after doing the steps. It was, it was astonishing. I, you know, I, I became a more loving person. I became a less fearful person. I became a more optimistic. I mean, I wasn't drinking. Anyone knew? Sorry, forgot that bit. I wasn't drinking after I did the 12 steps because of this change. The steps work from the inside out. They change these things inside of me. And because of that, I not only, it wasn't a case of resisting drink. I didn't want it. I didn't want it. What a, what a feeling. And I'm sure if you're new, you know. If you're an alcoholic like me and you're new, you, you probably, maybe you're thinking, well, if he truly has got to a stage where he just doesn't miss drink, where he doesn't, uh, doesn't miss drink, doesn't crave it at all, doesn't have to resist it, maybe he's not an alcoholic like me. But what I've told you about my lack of desire for alcohol, it's not that I'm different to you. It's that I've done something different to you. I've done the 12 steps. You haven't yet done the 12 steps. That's the, that's the difference. It's the action. It's not who I am. I'm just another alcoholic. But when I did the 12 steps, the desire to drink um, dissolved. It, it dissolved. And um, if you're new and you want to know what my drinking used to be like, not, not all the drinking I did, but how I felt about it, how I tricked myself into it, how I craved it, how I loathed myself about how I felt about drink. If you want to know about that, come and speak to me afterwards. But um, I am an alcoholic. I'm a recovered alcoholic. So what happened then? Well, 29 years happened then. Um, so what's life like in recovery? It's long, <laughs> you know, because, you know, it's, I mean, step three, okay, I understand for atheists, agnostics, whatever, step three, even if you try and reinterpret it, it can make you nervous. But, but um, one of the aspects of step three, you, you can't guarantee how your life's going to go. You can't, can't guarantee what's going to happen to your family, what's going to happen to your body, what illnesses are going to happen around you, all these things, jobs, Chris, you can't guarantee any of that. But um, astonishing things have happened to me in, in the last... Uh, in the last, you know, 30 years. Um, and I've, I think the, where are we on the timer? Oh God, you've got another like eight minutes of me talking about how great my life has been. <laughs> Sorry about that. Normally I just go on about the drinking and you're all spared that bit. But I'm trying, if I can try and put it, I, I'll, so if I try and relate it back to things. So, um, I mean, one of the things that, that happened, I went back to uni. I'm, I'm very sort of academic. I love learning. I love analysis. I love mathematics. I love quantum physics. I love relativity. I love artificial intelligence theory. I love computer programming. So for me to go back to uni and complete my uh, maths degree was not an effort. It was a desire. Um, and when I went back there, there was... You know, I could just say to you, oh, I just, I got, I got good marks. But there was something else, some other things happened as well. Um, and one of the things, I remember I would go off to the mature students lounge on my own and I would do my maths because I, I do start on the homework. I'd have my, in those days, you could have a roll up and have a roll up, sit in the mature students lounge, do my maths homework. And I was loving it. Oh, maths, I love it. And, um, and eventually, after a few weeks of this, the other students were like, why don't you come to lunch with us? Come to coffee with us? And I thought, well, that's not an unreasonable request, really, is it? Um, so I panicked, of course, and I rang my sponsor. I said, they want me to join them for lunch. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and he, uh, he, he said, uh, oh, just um, think what you can take to it. Think what you can bring to it. And it's funny, uh, you know, I say that to newcomers sometimes, and I think, does that just sound like a cliche? Or I hear other people say it in their shares, and I think, does that sound like a cliche? But on that day, it changed my life. You know, I haven't been able to stick to it every day since that day. I rang him afterwards. He got a lot of calls from me. Though. I rang him afterwards, and I was like, that was amazing. It worked. It worked. Uh, and I started to learn something about life, and I think I'd learned it while doing the steps. You know, you can, I, and uh, I love the axioms of quantum physics. I love the axiomatic approach to quantum physics because you write down six things and you can prove all of basic 
quantum physics from those six things. It's a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful feeling. Life isn't like that. When somebody, um, you know, being told to see what you can bring to a social event, that's nowhere in the axioms of quantum physics. Nobody, you can't prove that. I can't prove that from my past experience. Um, so I had a great, so as a result of that, I had a much better social life while I was at, at uh, uni. And I did, because I wasn't drinking, because I was on fire, I was so grateful. I was spiritually healthy. I ended up, and I found this out because I, I looked over the desk at a reference that um, my math tutor had written for me. But apparently, I got one of the best degree, math degrees that they'd ever given, you know. So, and um, I was, I remember walking up to see it when I went up to see the marks. And I, these are all very personal recollections, right? And they don't mean a lot to other people. And other people might well, I got this job or I got this promotion. But I, 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 I was listening to Nirvana really loud, like smells like teen spirits. And I knew the results were coming out. And I was walking up to the, um, and uh, I was in anything but spiritual mood. I was like, what, what did I get? What did I get? Um, because I knew I wasn't an idiot. I knew I had the potential to lead a useful life and to use my talents but year after year I told my parents and the people around me I'll do better I'll study better I'll stop drinking I'll, I'll show you I didn't say it like that but I, that's what I meant I will show you I'm not an idiot I'm not a flake I'm not a loser and um and that was all this I was thinking and this was like a number and I know the numbers aren't important but it was important to me in a way at that time and I walked up the stairs and I saw my bloody number <laughs> And I won't tell you it, but what I will tell you is I took Nirvana out and it was like, it wasn't like a second spiritual awakening, but it was a great feeling. And I was able to ring my mum. My mum, after years of agony, seeing me go downhill, desperately trying to help me, was able to hear this, this, um, this great news, you know. Um, yeah, I don't really want to, how long have I got? I don't want to keep on going on about, what else can I talk about? It isn't just great things that I've achieved. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, it's trying to tr tread a balance, because what I'm trying to say, so let me maybe put it another way. What I want to put to the newcomer, all right? When I was new, I thought a few things, like spiritual awakening, even if I can have a spiritual awakening, because it's not real, even if it works, even if it's like some fabrication of psychology, um, and even if it works... I will be outside of society, because this isn't normal, right? Having a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, it's weird. So even if it stops me drinking, I will be weird. I'll be outside of society. I won't be able to travel around the world, because I'll probably be wearing a monk's cassock, or a, uh, you know, or be in a monastery or something, because I'll be so spiritual. And Or I won't be able to do things like... So I was very into... Uh, Wall Street and the city. I was a bit, uh, not as talented as Bill W, but I was obsessed as Bill W about Wall Street and the, and the city of London. And I thought, well, if I do the, the 12 steps, I'm not going to have that cutting, you know, the, 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 what's it called? The, uh, the killing edge. I can't even remember what it's called. I'm making things up here, but I'm not going to have the killer instinct. That's it. If I, if I do the 12 steps and I live by my higher power's will, and I try to live a life of love for my fellow man and woman, how am I going to have the killer instinct to, rip off the face of another trader and take them for 12 billion pounds. So I basically, what I want to say to you, if you knew, I mean, I'm not suggesting you do the 12 steps and you go and rip off the face of another trader to earn 12 billion pounds. What I'm saying, there's no limits. There are no limits to what you can get involved in, in, in the normal world. You know, I've traveled all around the world. I've had careers and career opportunities that that still amaze me, that still amaze me. And, if, and um, something happened to me recently, 30 years in, something happened to me recently. And um, what does two two mean? Does two twos mean four? No, okay. <laughs> I was hopeful there that two, yeah. Uh, so, and I was, uh, so I've been all around the world. I've had, and a recent thing happened to me and I just said to my girlfriend again today, I said, I can't believe that they've invited me onto this scheme um it's to do with writing it's it's like a national writing scheme for a, an, an elite organization one of the best like uh tv uh organizations in the world have invited me 
onto their writing scheme that 5,000 people from around the country apply to. And um, I say to my girlfriend, and this is like weeks after it happened, I can't believe this has actually happened to me. I still can't believe it. And I would like to link it back once, and I'm not just doing this to try and seem a little bit humble, but I did mean to say this earlier. One of the things that's helped me, and this isn't necessarily something you have to do as a core of your recovery, but right at the beginning, while I was doing the steps, and I was probably talking about all my dreams to Wayne, I want to make a billion dollars, I want to write a, 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 you know, a Nobel Prize winning model, I'm a genius, I don't know what I was saying to him, but I was saying, and he said to me, Alex, we can live our dreams in AA, we can live our dreams. And that, for some reason, for somebody that I knew, went from doing whatever he was doing to getting photos published all in the major newspapers for years, I knew that he was telling the truth and I believed it and I have, I guess, lived my dreams. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. My name is Jo, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, thanks, Alexis, for your share. It is really just such an honour to be invited to share tonight. I'm just so grateful. And welcome to any newcomers. This is a great place to be if you want to get sober and live happy. And I remember first being introduced to this home group. I was kind of dotting around different meetings, different types of meetings. And I'd heard a lot of bad press about this group, like Alexis was saying. But one thing I remember is being at a different meeting, and Jay shared about this last week, you saw Mike D the day before he got kicked out of treatment or something. I met Mike D at a meeting the day he got kicked out of treatment afterwards, and he was just, um, he was just in bits. He was just, you know, it was just sad to see another alcoholic. But the thing was, like, I felt the same as he was looking. Sorry to embarrass you, Mike. I know you won't mind me saying this. And, and um, I carried kind of going around to different meetings. And then I came here about um, three weeks later, and I saw the same person, but he was just completely different. He'd obviously had this spiritual awakening. And I just was thinking, what has he done? Why is he so different in three weeks? This person's gone from being an absolute bit, not being able to stop drinking to just being absolutely happy and loving life sober. And that's, you know, I started coming along to this meeting and just met a group of people that were all the same. And I just remember feeling so welcome. I hadn't been made welcome for anywhere in such a long time. Like my drinking was so bad and my character defects, the way that I was just around my family and my loved ones was just absolutely horrendous. So I was just delusional. I just thought it's, you know, blamed everyone else for everything. And I was just a horrible, difficult, just a difficult person to be around. And coming into uh, this home group and just hearing people, they were sharing that their drinking was like mine. They had this phenomenon of craving. They had this mental obsession. They were miserable and depressed when they got so when they tried to get sober. And just hearing them share that they'd once been like me, they'd got a sponsor, gone through the 12 steps of AA, had this spiritual awakening, and they were now able to live happy, sober lives. And I was absolutely, I was just blown away by it. And I, I was just so impressed. And that kept me coming back to meetings. And they, like I said, these people made me feel welcome. And they remembered my name. They wanted me to come back the next week. And I, I, I was just amazed. I was blown away. And but I needed to put some work in. I needed to get a sponsor and work through the 12 steps. And I was really sceptical, like Alexis was talking about. I just kept thinking, oh, they're going to control me and tell me what to do. But I just got this sponsor. She kept it so simple for me. She just asked, are you willing to go to any lengths of victory over alcoholism? And I was. I was absolutely beaten. I, these people had, thank you, these people had absolutely smashed at home to me that I... You, I I was not going to be able to stay, stay sober on my own. And I went through the 12 steps and I just had an incredible time. I just had this, you know, like Alexis talked about, I did this step four and five and I learned all about my defects and how like I could just take responsibility for the way that I felt. And I didn't have to blame the whole world for like all my self pity and anger and resentment and went on to do that step eight and nine, like Alexis mentioned again, and just made those amends and 
All those promises that it talks about in the big book have come true for me and continue to come true for me. I'm just able to comprehend the word serenity. I know peace of mind, uh, just like that fear. I still get fearful, but it's just nothing. Like, I don't need to drink to deal with it today. I can just walk through life and just enjoy it. And I have got an amazing life today. I've been sober for just over 25 years, <laughs> and I, I've just... I'm so grateful, like the sponsorship I've had in this group, I've just continued to be able to listen to my sponsor. I've continued to be in the middle of an active home group and be active, take part in service and keep helping newcomers. And I've just kept walking. Like, and all the times over the years when I've thought, like, I don't really feel like it, I've just done it anyway. I've just put the actions in and my life is amazing today. And I've got my own little family today. I'm married. I've got this lovely little boy that... You know, and I'm just so privileged I'm able to spend the time with him and be there for school pickups and be there for the school holidays. And it's all a, res all as a, a result of just putting the work in, just putting one foot in front of the other, just listening to the old timers, listening to the experience that has gone before me, just being prepared to take on board like someone else's viewpoint and not just listen to my own head all the time and think, I'm right, I know best. <laughs> I know best. I think it, therefore it's right. I just needed to just put that to one side and just be willing to listen to experience. And if you can do that, if you've got step one, it's easy. If once I knew I was beaten, it was easy to do that. And uh, you can just have an absolutely fantastic life. Then that's my five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Evening all, my name's John and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Look at Nick F down there, good to see you. Um, what a privilege and honour it is to be sharing at my home group and to see all you lovely folks. Thanks to all the people who've come down from far and wide. It's an absolute pleasure to have you at my home group. Um, I checked with my wife, I said, I said before I left, I said, um, how do I look? And she said, you look gorgeous. <laughs> so, which ain't bad for 33 years of marriage, is it? Unless he's humouring me. Do they do that? Do, do wives, do they, do they, do they? Do you think they do that? I'm going to check it when I get back. And um, I'm not going to physically harm her. But she, you know, unlike I did 30 years ago when she tried to stop me from getting a drink or strangled her to blackout because she wouldn't get out of the way. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, and, I, and I, 30 years ago, um, I'm 29 years sober. 30 years ago, um, I was down John's the Barber's in Frankfurt Gate in Plymouth after a skin fall, and I got him to take all my hair off, just like Mike D there. I got him to take all my hair off because I, I, I wanted to look mean. I wanted to look mean because I felt cross. I was angry. I had bitter resentments against the world and, and all the people in it. And, um, and I was about to go and get some bobber boots and a Harrington jacket and, um, you know, and, and, and really show, show them what it was all about. And I, 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 but I'm just not that. I'm too posh for all that shit. And, um, <laughs> uh, but g give me Eagles Greatest Hit, 71 to 75. That's more my, uh, more my thing. Uh, e easy, peaceful, easy feeling. That's, you know. So all that, it, it was just nonsense. It was just resentment, fear, you know, and shame at myself for all the horrible things I'd done, all the sexual conduct that I was going to not tell anybody about. And, um, you know, and uh, so that was April, that, well, that literally was April 1994. And, um, and the good folks, <clears throat> Wayne and Alexis, thank you for starting this group. Wayne, thank you uh, for being my sponsor. And um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's meant everything to me, um, sponsorship, this home group. But those, those two guys and a bunch of others, you know, were kind enough to form the Road to Recovery group, just as I was getting my ears lowered by John the Barber. Um, so that when I finally admitted complete defeat, you know, this, this inability to live life on life's terms, self-will run riot, full of misery, depression, anxiety, struggling to try and wrest happiness out of this world by managing wells, it says in 60-something of the big book, you know, and just, uh, you know, and I, I was nowhere near as clever as Alexis, so I mean, it, intelligence wasn't going to help me, rubbish at maths. And, um, but I listened to these people, and I, I listened to Wayne, and I listened to Alexis, people who, who, who declared that despite all their talents, if it wasn't for the 12-step program and sponsorship, they'd be on the bones of their ass. They'd be dead, probably, by now, a long time ago. And, um, you know, and, and that, that impressed me. That, that I thought, ah, I can be happy 
by doing it someone else's way. I can be, I can get, I can be happy by trying to find what my higher power's will is for me on a daily basis. If I was just willing to believe that, say, my home group is a power greater than me, which it certainly was. Twelve or fifteen guys then, the odd woman turned up, and when I say odd, I mean odd. Uh, you know, and um, yeah, not like today, um, but <clears throat> one or two odd ones. But, you know, uh, yeah, and, yeah, but it was a power greater than me then, just as it is here with a hundred and something odd people in it tonight. You know, th there's a power here, you know, tradition too. You know, there's a power, and I thought, yes, I, th this is a power that I'm willing to believe is, a, is greater than myself. And my sponsor gave me some, you know, he walked into McDonald's one Friday night and he gave me, uh, he gave me, uh, he gave me, he gave me a bit of paper and he wrote down the th six things that Alexis talked about on a scrap of paper, phone him up, read it just for the day card, read the big book, call newcomers, get a home group, get to meetings, you know, clean up, do the ashtrays, all that sort of malarkey. And, and, I, and I was a slow start, I didn't get the grips with it straight, straight away, but if, when I started to follow these principles, take these spiritual actions in Alcoholics Anonymous, I commenced to get results. And when I started going through the steps, and you know, when I got to that fifth step that Alexis spoke about, and I read out all this stuff, including the stuff that I will take into the grave, I, it blew my mind. The obsession with alcohol was lifted out of me. I went back to the wife, not to strangle her, but to hug her with joy and say, sweetheart, there's a God. There is a God. You know, you know, and I bored her to death with, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. But, you know, she'd have been history. I wouldn't have two kids in their 20s and 30s now. I wouldn't have a job. I wouldn't be semi-retired, living the life riding my bike everywhere. I just wouldn't be living this wonderful life if it wasn't for Alcoholics Anonymous, if it wasn't for sponsorship, and if it wasn't for the Road to Recovery Group. Thank you, the Road to Recovery Group. Thanks, Alexis, Joe and John. And tonight's main speaker is Wayne. My name is Wayne and I'm an alcoholic. Wayne. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you, the first three speakers. And uh, I've got to say, at the start of the meeting, I, I was looking around the room and, and, and the, the depth of experience that's here tonight is overwhelming. In fact, I'm quite nervous. Aww. Thank you, that feels much better. Anyway, <laughs> I, um, I mean, when I got here, when I, when I was drinking, I, I, I was just desperately unhappy. I mean, I was full of fear. I, was just, I just couldn't speak to people. Life was uncomfortable sober. I couldn't live comfortable without alcohol. You know, I preferred seeing life through a drunken haze, just one step removed from everybody else. Just a few drinks, it just seemed to take the edge off things. A few drinks just made me okay. A few drinks, I could, I could just be the person that I wanted to be. I, I could be who I wanted to be around you. And, you know, you didn't matter anymore. You know, I was worth the party was at after a few drinks and uh, unfortunately I, I drink and I, I would get into trouble, I'd do things I desperately regretted and, and I would apologise and I would promise I will never do it again I promise I will not do it again I'm, I'm, I'm never going to drink ever but I always eventually did I, I mean, I might last a week. I might usually the weekend, and uh, you know. But there was there was just nothing better. You know, I was in my in, in my attic or at work or wherever it was. You know, that sense of ease and comfort which comes instantly by taking a few drinks. Just the crack, you know, that distinctive sound, the crack of a bottle of vodka or a ping of a can of super tenants, and I just feel instantly at ease. You know, it, you know, life was going to be all right. You know, I was where the party was at. And, uh, I mean, one, one night, I remember one night I, I, was, I was drinking with my mates. They'd, they'd all gone home. I was sat in a subway. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, if only I could feel like this all the time. And it dawned on me in that moment, I could. I've just got to drink all the time. And uh, the problem is I was a, a lady's hairdresser. And I, I would, uh, I, I, it got to the point I just couldn't walk to work. I couldn't get past the off-license without going in the off-license. You know, as soon as I, I got a drink, I'd in, in the off-license, and, and I would go to work, and I would just, I mean, it, it, it was terrible. You know, it, 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 was, it wasn't good. And uh, I, uh, I mean, one night, it ended like this. I was, we, we were doing a hair show, and uh, somebody asked me to t tell you this uh, a while ago. We were doing a hair show, and it was meant to be a big, really big, fancy place. There were about 500 people. It was massive. And uh, they said to me, Wayne, no drinking tonight, Wayne. And 
I just couldn't do it. You know, I got past that awful license. I just, I, I just could not not drink. And unfortunately, that physical allergy to alcohol took over. And by the time we got to the fashion show, I was up on the stage. Everybody that meant anything to me, all the people I loved were in the front row. And I was swearing at everybody. I was sticking two fingers up. I was spitting at people. And I got thrown out. And uh, outside, I pushed my dad in front of a bus. I was in the car park on top of him having a fight. They calmed me down. When we were driving home, my, my parents were in the front. I was in the back with my girlfriend. And uh, you know, I was reasonably calm. We were driving home, and I saw the lights of what looked like a pub in the distance. We were driving along, along quite a fast A road. And I said, look, I need, can we stop? I need, I need a drink. And they wouldn't stop. So I, I, I just leant over and I, and I started strangling him uh, as we were driving. You know, we almost crashed the car. And as that's how I get when I drink. I am disgustingly and dangerously antisocial. I'm one of those leery drunks. You know those people you see that just, you just keep away. They're leery. They're going to be trouble. That's what I was like. And uh, I uh, ended up, um, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, it wasn't like I didn't try to stop drinking. It wasn't like I didn't try to control my behavior. I mean, I tried doctors, I tried counselors, I tried treatment facilities. I tried a doctor in, out in Plimpton, and uh, he said to me, he said, Wayne, there are no alcoholics in Plimpton. Plimpton is the posh area, okay? And he, there are no alcoholics in Plimpton, uh, okay? I went to the Alcohol Advisory Council. I mean, that's what, it's, it's called the Harbour Centre now, but it's the Alcohol Advisory Council. And they said to me, Wayne, put three coins in your pocket. When there are no coins left, stop drinking. You know, every time you have a drink, take a, just stop. And I just got my change mixed up. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. You know, I went into a treatment centre at 23, you know, a miserable, suicidal alcoholic. A few weeks later, I emerged a miserable, suicidal amateur psychiatrist and I went to Alcoholics Anonymous you know I attended meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and I started doing what I saw the people around me do I would go to meetings I mean believe me I was a, I was just such a bad example I mean I was I was just a terrible example you know I, I mean I, I in fact after that treatment center I, I lasted 11 weeks 11 weeks of going to meetings. That was the longest I ever did. 11 weeks, I'd go to meetings and, and I would whine and I would cry and I would moan and I would blame the world for my problems. And uh, one night, I come from the meeting and I had a bottle of vodka and it was right there. And, you know, I, I'm just not like those people in the meeting. You know, I'm just not like those people. You know, they, they, they all drink 10 bottles of whiskey a day. They kill people. You know, they're all in the Navy. I'm not like those people. You know, surely... You know, if, if I was a real alcoholic, if I was like those people at the meeting, there's no way I'd be able to sit here with that bottle of vodka right there, feeling as comfortable as I do. And I feel relaxed. Surely I'd be frothing at the mouth. I'm all right. So I took a drink. You know, that is the, <laughs> the insidious insanity of alcoholism. You know, I had the physical allergy and I had that mental twist that kept tricking me again and again and again to take that first drink. And uh, like I say, I was a bad example. My best mate in AA said to me, my sponsors told me to keep away from you. You know, I mean, I was just such a bad example. You know, I, I would, I, and, and that's the point. And there, there may be a lot of people here. If you're like me, it's possible to sit in a meeting like this, week in, week out, for years. It's possible to sit in the best meeting in the world, week in, week out, for years. But if I do not take the 12 steps, my life will get progressively and systematically worse over a prolonged period. I have to take the steps. That's what AA has to offer, 12 steps. It doesn't take 12 days, 12 weeks, 12 months. It takes 12 steps. And uh, like I say, so I, I, I was at this point, and, I, and, and like I say, I, mean, I remember being at a meeting, I was crying, I was telling everybody, I'm, after the meeting, I'm going to jump off the bridge, you know, and, and they, they'd come up to me after and say, that was a great share, Wayne, that was, that was, that was, that was gut level honesty, and I, I, I thought so, and I just, I just get back to my bed sit, and it would just, just be awful, and then one day, by mistake, I met the people they warned me about, you know, keep away from them. You know, they're the Joy Boys, the God Squad, the Magic Circle, the Magnificent Seven. Keep away from them. And you know, everybody hated them. 
But these guys were different. These guys had a purpose. They spoke with conviction. They had direction. There was something, they were excited and enthusiastic about Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I wanted and needed what they had. And they told me if I wanted to recover, if I wanted to change my life significantly for the better, I'd have to take those 12 steps. And that I was suffering from a condition which only a spiritual experience would conquer. And only a spiritual experience would conquer. But the most satisfactory years of my existence lie ahead. I mean, what a thing. The most satisfactory years of my existence lie ahead. In regardless of my current circumstances, in the same for anybody here, whatever your current circumstances, you do what we do and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world. What a remarkable thing that is an offer here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is what they promised me. And uh, they were all saying the same old crap, you know, and I kept turning up. And, uh, and I eventually realized they were saying this for me because that's what I have to do. You know, what they are said, the, the reason they keep repeating themselves again and again and again is because that's what I have to do. And they were talking about getting a sponsor. And, and if you haven't got a sponsor, I am terrible at choosing sponsors. Absolutely awful. Um, so don't come to me for advice choosing a sponsor. My sponsors never, ever listen to me. And uh, I, um, I eventually got this. My first sponsor took me shoplifting. But, uh, uh, but my... my but the, the, the guy I call my first sponsor, um, I mean, I'd ring him up and I'd say, oh my God, it's happened again. And he would say, well, bless you, lad. That's a deeply moving story. Have you read your big book today? You're like, what? Yeah. I ring him up next week. Oh no. And he said, well, bless you, lad. Your story's touched me deeply. Go and work with a newcomer. You know, this guy just didn't care how I felt. He just didn't care. He didn't like me. And I see now that he cared deeply how I felt. He was more concerned with what I was doing because what I do affects how I feel. If I do the right things, I'm going to feel good. And uh, one day I had to call him and uh, I thought, oh no, he's going to, you know, this is bad. You know, I, I mean, even I knew this was bad. And oh God, I said, oh David, and I can't, the, the words that came down the line of the farm were just amazing. And it's, it, well, bless you, lad. If you're honest with me, I'm on your side. And that's the deal I make with the people I sponsor. If you are honest with me, I am on your side. And uh, ev eventually he died, and he died sober. And I, I had to get another sponsor. And one, one, of, one of my sponsees had just come back from America, and he had a lot of tapes. And he said, listen, listen to the, I don't like AA tapes. I don't like listening to them. But I, I conceded, I'm going to listen to this old boy. And I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. There was this other guy, the other side of the world, who was being accused of being a dictator-type sponsor. I thought, wow, I'm, all, I'm being accused of being a dictator-type sponsor. And he had, a, he had a group of AA stormtroopers in Los Angeles. And I had a gang of spiritual hooligans. So I thought, this is great. This guy's perfect. So I rang him up and I said, have you been my sponsor? And the phone went dead. And I called him after about three times. I realized he just, he, he, that was how it was going to be. Yeah. Duh. But um, he started sponsoring me. I, I'd never seen this guy. I didn't know what he looked like. And then after about six months of calling him every week, he, uh, he, he came to England. And somebody said to me, he's over there. I thought, Great. You know, he, here's my moment. This, this is my time. And I said, hi, I'm Wayne. I'm Wayne. I said, I said, I've been calling you every week for six months. You know, I've been emailing you. I'm Wayne, you sponsor me. And he, he looked at me straight in the eye. He put two hands on my head and said, you never drink again, kid. And off he went. And that was the end of that. So, no, I would be forgiven for saying, well, just screw you. I'm not putting up with that crap. I never, I don't put up with stuff like that. I'm not going to, why the hell am I going to put up with that? I'm not going to put up with that. But by the time I'd got to my seat, which was no further than over here, I'd process what had happened. There's perhaps not another living soul in the world that I will listen to right now. This is working for me. I do not need to be frivolous and pally-pally with my sponsor. I just need to listen to my sponsor. So for the first time in my adult life, I shut up. And there's a name for that. If you're new and you don't know what that name is, it's called Step One. So I shut up. Because all I ever did, all the time, somebody would say something that pissed me off, something I didn't like, and my instinctive reaction was to run. Resentment and fear would jump to the defense of my ego 
and it kept my life in a perpetual cycle of insanity. So for the first time, I just shut up and I stuck with it. And thank God I, could, I did. Now, I'm going to tell this boring story. I know all the local people hate it, but it sums up to me what sponsorship is all about. It's got nothing to do with sponsorship, but it sums it up perfectly. Okay, Bill Wilson was in the AA clubhouse in New York in the 30s, and I've got this, this romantic image of, the, uh, of a, new, a club in New York. And he, and he said he, he was sat on his bed, and it, he could hear the rain coming down off the, hitting on the old tin, tin roof. And I've got this image of you know, neon signs in reflections outside in New York in the 30s. Just a romantic image. Nothing like that, but that's what I've got in my mind. But Bill was saying, he said, he had a knock, a knock on, the, on the door. The janitor said to him, he said, he said, Bill, some other guy's just turned up. He said, you know, he knew Bill had had a hard day. Do you want me to send him away? He said, no, I'll send him up. And he said he could hear this guy coming down the hallway. And he said, this guy sounded in so much pain. He sounded in so much, tr he was struggling and laboring down the hallway. He opened the door, this guy came in, he took his scarf off, he took his hat off, he saw a clerical collar. He said the guy had, there was a presence in his eyes, there was something about him, there was something there. That guy was Father Edward Dowling, who became Bill's uh, spiritual sponsor. Now, the reason I say that is, he suffered from chronic arthritis. He was a man who was in a lot of physical pain. But he was in New York, and while he was there, he said, I was watching some people ice skate and they were gliding across the ice. So, they were gliding across the ice with so much grace, they made me feel like I could do the same. That is sponsorship. When I came here and I didn't think I could have what you had because you were all cleverer than me, when I just didn't believe I could do it, my sponsor made me feel like I could do the same. But what happens? You know, I'm 35 years sober now. You know, I don't need a sponsor, to, usually, to make me feel like I can do the same. I know I can do the same. So what is the point of sponsorship? Because none of us need a sponsor what we actually need is sponsoring, and they are two different things. And uh, because I've seen some of the mistakes people make, what can happen is sobriety can almost become the enemy. I'm getting away with it. I'm not drinking. I've seen it all. I've done it all. I know it all. I've read the traditions, I, you know, I know the traditions, I know the concepts, I've been to intergroup, I've, I've been to region, I may have even been to conference. There's nothing you can tell me. There's nothing you can tell me anymore. I'm the finished article. <laughs> then one day, out of the blue, and it may come after a couple of years, it may come after a couple of decades. You know, you've been keeping that sponsor at bay, just doing enough, ticking boxes, turning up at your home group, checking in once a week, doing your two poxy meetings. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, your sponsor sponsors you. Years of just, yeah, how are you doing? He says something you don't like. He says something that's inconvenient. And worse than that, he's wrong. Your sponsor's wrong. And I don't mean wrong, he's just misunderstood me. I mean, he's wrong, wrong. He's really wrong. Everybody would agree with me, my sponsor is wrong. At that point, I'm just defending my position and I'm being sponsored by a magic mirror. Mirror, mirror, on the wall, who is the greatest of them all? Last year, I was with my sponsor and he said to me, he said, Wayne, you're not going to like this. <laughs> Uh, and I, oh yeah, try me. <laughs> and he said, I want you to go to one extra meeting a week outside your home group. And in my head, I'm thinking, 100 miles an hour, what? <laughs> an extra meeting a week? I go to three already. I'm more active than anybody I know. I'm 35 years sober. My life is better than ever. Why the hell do I need to go to one of these other crap meetings? But I heard myself say, yeah, all right. 
because I have that feeling of being sponsored. There's something quietly, invisibly in the background reigning in my ego, the thing that will kill me. We've got this uh, secret Facebook group. A lot of you are probably on it. And very often, I'm, uh, I'm, there, I'm there on my computer, and I'm, I'm thinking, Alex, John, you lazy bastards. And I'm, and I'm, uh, Joe, the steering committee is not the Gestapo, and I'm just about to press post. And I think, damn, some moron added my sponsor to that group. He'll, he'll see it. And I think, shit. And there's something invisibly in the background appealing to my higher nature. There's something invisibly in the background, just the better self appealing to it. And I do the columns three and four instead. I do, I do a, you know, an inventory. And uh, so uh, that, that's what I need. I mean, I mean when um, David died, my first sponsor, Dave, David B., he, I was 10 years sober. And I went, this is, this is the thought process, okay? I, I, I thought, well, okay, I'm 10 years sober now. I mean, I know it all. I mean, there's nothing that a sponsor can tell me. Maybe I can get one of these gentler sponsors. Maybe I can get an easier, softer sponsor. You know, I can get some guy local. He can pop around, sit in the garden if he wants. I might even be able to help him, you know. And uh, <laughs> but something told me that ain't going to work. So I went from the frying pan to the fire, and I asked Clancy. And if you think Clancy was a cuddly old man, he would take no shit, believe me. And uh, when, when I was 30 years sober, Clancy died. And this is the thought process. I'm 30 years sober now. I know it all. I'm the finished article. You can't tell me anything. I, there's, there's no, I mean, I sponsor people. There's nothing another sponsor. I, I know as much as all of them. What's the point? I can just get somebody local. In fact, I, I could probably get an American. And this is the clincher. It's none of their business. I don't have to tell them who it is. All I've got to do is say, he's an American, and they'll all go, ooh. You know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if he wants to fly over, he can fly over. We can sit in the garden and chill out. <laughs> I might even be able to help him, you know. <laughs> but I quickly realized that, that isn't going to work for me. So I went from the uh, fire to the volcano. And I asked Bob to sponsor me. That's the fool that told me to go to Narnia. He said, you know, up the top desk. I mean, I tried pleading with him. I said, look, top desk is full of hippies. But he wouldn't have it. You know, I was going, going to top desk. I, I was at a meeting. I, I can see the light. Don't worry. Um, I was at a meeting um, outside London. And uh, an old timer said to me, he, he said, is AA changing in your area? And uh, I thought about it. I said, it may well be changing in our area but it ain't changing at our group. We practice the democracy of the dead. The people who are no longer with us matter. Their opinions matter. Their vote matter. Pe people like David and Clancy, people who, who have just helped us, we do not compromise what we were taught just because they're no longer here. We, this group works on tradition and custom. We do what we do. And, you know, we have structure. We have discipline. We have accountability. We have a strong sponsorship ethic. We have a strong service ethic. And, uh, you know, we smarten up to share. We don't swear and use the F word every other word. That's just what we do. And that is, we don't compromise with that. And some people don't like it. Some people rebel. And they run, waving flags of indignation. And they find an easier, softer group. They find an easier, softer sponsor. And they think they're going to be all right. The majority of those people eventually, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, discover that all the things they didn't like, all the things they rebelled against, are all the things that made all the difference in the first place. You know, those are the things I need. And... Uh, yeah, it's, this group in 30 years has never, ever been made weaker by people leaving. It's always been made stronger by the example of the people who remain. You know, when the white winds blow and the snows fall, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. So we, uh, we just got to keep marching. We just got to keep doing these things. I mean, even, even when we feel bad... You know, I've got this other little boring story, which I'm going to tell you. It's, um, I mean, I, I'm fascinated with the military. I, mean, we got, I was speaking to a military man earlier on. I'm fascinated with the military. We, um, 
you know, I, I was never in the military, but I was, I'm just, I'm just, I, I, admi I admi an admiration for the military. You know, I, I watch these stories on the telly, you know, listen on the, on the, in the paper, and, and, and incredible acts of bravery. You think, well, how did they do that? How, how on earth did they do that? And usually in the small print, right at the end, somebody says, very often, we trusted in our training. And that's what we do here. When all hell breaks loose, when the shit is really at the fan and we just don't think we can carry on, we just trust in our training, those very simple actions which brought us to that place of comfort in the first place. You know, you know we've got to find a higher power. I needed a higher power. And uh, I, I mean, I just, I didn't like your... You know, they, they talked about God. I didn't like the felt banners with Jesus loves you on. I didn't like the tambourines. You know, I, I, where it says in the big book, you know, the verdict of the ages is men of faith have courage. Verdict means pronouncement of truth in Latin. So that's important. So I went back through the ages and I looked at a time when men prayed before they went into battle. And that appealed to me. You know, I, I, I could work with that. I mean, you can work, you can have your banners and what, you can have whatever you want, but that worked for me. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I've had a good life here. This has changed my life, you know, significantly for the better. You know, but we've got to try and practice these principles in all our affairs. We've got to try and grow spiritually. And, you know, how, how do we do that? How, I mean, how do we, how does somebody sober my length for sobriety or anybody really? How, how, how I saw somebody taking a picture there. Um, how do we do that? You know, when we're in a place where there's, just full of sensitive souls defending their egos. How, how do how, you know when we're in a place with people who are different than we are? Pe pe people with different political views, people with with different religious views, people who, who are boring, people who are exciting. You know, how, how do we practice those principles? You know, well, for me, growing spiritually, it really, it's got little to do with all the books I can read, all the retreats I can go on, how much I can talk about God. My relationship with God is simply a reflection of my relationship with the people around me. So can I be, when I'm with those people, patient, kind, tolerant, loving, and understanding? Am I able to be just a little bit more generous in my judgment of other people? And fortunately, for people like us, there's one place, one special place in the world where flawed and imperfect alcoholics gather to, to begin to practice those spiritual principles. And tonight, it's called the Road to Recovery Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Happy birthday! Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.